Whitechapel Wednesdays. Welcome to our new series of Whitechapel Wednesdays. In this weekly series, we cull together news reports in chronological order leading up to the infamous series of slayings. As Ripper enthusiasts will know, there is considerable discussion as to whether the slayings were confirmed only to the five reported. We have included reports outside of the five to show the build-up of terror in the Whitechapel area. We have also included other sometimes seemingly minor news stories during this time to give you a picture of the life and times of Whitechapel of 1888 as events build to the series of slayings. In this series, we offer no comment but adhere strictly to the papers of the times, all in chronological order. We hope you enjoy the show. From the Banbury Advertiser, March 1888, the degradation of the White Chapel area. Mr. Thompson went on to describe the East End and showed that all respectable people had forsaken it, and it was now inhabited only by the most degraded, who had disgraced themselves in other places and went to the East as a refuge, many of them being wanted. Mothers would put their babies of a few weeks or months old on the floor of a public house while she fought or joined in the revels going on. Little girls of three years of age were developed in lying and craft that would baffle anyone. Eight roomed houses had in them eight families and took in lodgers besides. It was impossible to get the proper names of the people and they could not be traced. That has the class of population they had to deal with. He had seen a woman eat the whole of a raw red herring commencing at the head. Children were seen scratching among the offal from the fish and other stalls to find a scrap of green stuff to eat. The people had to wear the same clothing day and night and had no beds. Some of them could not remember the last time they were washed, and a consequence were, quote, lively, unquote. From Lloyd Weekly Newspaper, April 1888, Stabbed in the Throat. At an early hour on Wednesday morning, an outrage of a most murderous character was perpetrated upon a woman named Ada Wilson, who occupies a house at 9 Millman Street, Burdett Row, Bow. Two constables on duty near the thoroughfare were shortly after midnight informed that a young person was being murdered at the address named. Upon the policemen running to the house, they discovered Ada Wilson lying in the passage in a pool of blood, bleeding from a wound in the throat, apparently caused by a direct stab from a knife. The victim was once conveyed to the London Hospital, Whitechapel, where her injuries were attended to. Subsequent inquiries made by the police revealed the fact that a dispute arose between the woman and a man who states is her husband, and after quarrelling with the woman, he stabbed her in the throat and made his escape by the front door of the house. He was pursued for some distance by a neighbour living opposite who heard loud screams proceeding from number nine. But the would-be murderer sharply turned a corner and was soon lost in the labyrinth of streets. A fairly accurate description of his appearance was, however, been obtained and has already been circulated at the various metropolitan police stations. Rose Beerman, a young woman lodging at 9 Millman Street, made the following statement. Ada Wilson, the injured woman, is the occupier of the house, but at the time of the outrage she was under notice to quit. 
I knew Mrs. Wilson as a married woman, although I had never seen her husband. Last evening she came into the house accompanied by a male companion, but whether he was her husband or not, I could not say. She has often had visitors to see her, but I have rarely seen them myself, as Mrs. Wilson lives in the front room, and my mother and I occupy two rooms upstairs. Well, I don't know who the young man was, but about midnight I heard the most terrible screams that one can imagine. Running downstairs, I saw Mrs. Wilson partially dressed, wringing her hands and, and crying, Stop that man from cutting my throat. He has stabbed me. She then fell fainting in the passage. I saw all that as I was coming downstairs, but as soon as I commenced to descend, I noticed a young, fair man rush to the front door and let himself out. From the Sheffield Evening Telegraph, April 1888. A Whitechapel Tragedy The other morning, information was forwarded to Mr. Wynne F. Baxter of the death of Annie Millwood, aged 38, a single woman who is alleged to have been the victim of a most violent and brutal attack and whose death is supposed to be due to the injuries inflicted. It appears that a few weeks ago, the deceased was admitted to the Whitechapel Infirmary, suffering from numerous stabs in the legs and lower part of the body. She stated that she had been attacked by a man whom she did not know and who stabbed her with a clasp knife. No one appears to have seen the attack, and so far, at present, ascertained there is only the woman's statement to bear out the allegations of an attack though she has been stabbed, cannot be denied. After her admission to the infirmary, the deceased progressed favourably and was sent to the South Grove workhouse, but while engaged in some occupation at the rear of the building, she was observed to fall, and it was found that she was dead. The coroner, on being communicated with, ordered a post-mortem examination to be made with a view to determining whether any one was criminally responsible for the death. From Lloyd's List, 3rd of April, 1888. Emma Elizabeth Smith. Yesterday, the authorities of the London Hospital informed the coroner of the death in that institution of Emma Elizabeth Smith, aged 45, a widow, lately living at 18 George Street, Spitalfields. The deceased was out on bank holiday and when returning home along the Whitechapel Road early on Tuesday morning, she was, it was alleged, set upon and severely maltreated by some men who afterwards made off, leaving her on the ground in a semi-conscious condition. She was subsequently conveyed to the hospital where she died. From the Belfast Weekly News, 14th of April, 1888, the Whitechapel Outrage Inquest and Verdict. This afternoon, Mr. Wynne E. Baxter, the East Middlesex coroner, held an inquiry at the London Hospital Whitechapel touching the death of Emma Elizabeth Smith, aged 45 years, a widow, lately living at 18 George Street, Spitalfields, who is alleged to have died from injuries received at the hands of some persons unknown, who brutally assaulted her when returning home along Whitechapel Road on bank holiday night. Chief Inspector West attended on behalf of the Commissioners of Police. Mary Russell of 18 George Street stated that the address was a common lodging house and the deceased had been a lodger there for some months. The deceased, Emma Elizabeth Smith, got her living on the streets, and when she returned home one night, she told a witness that she had been thrown out of a window. When she had had drink, the deceased acted like a madwoman. 
On bank holiday, the deceased left the house in the early evening, apparently in good health. She returned home between four and five o'clock that next morning, severely injured, and she said she had been shockingly treated by some men. Her face was bleeding, and she said that she was also injured about the lower part of her body. The witness, Mary Russell, took her at once to the hospital. The deceased further said that she was coming along Osborne Street in Whitechapel when she was set upon and her money taken from her. On the way to hospital, the deceased pointed out the spot and said she did not know the men, nor could she describe them. The witness, Mary Russell, believed that the statements made by the deceased woman were to be relied upon. Deposition from the coroner. The deceased had often come home with black eyes that men had given her. She was not so drunk as not to know what she did. Mr. George Haslip, the house surgeon, deposed that the deceased was admitted suffering from severe injuries. She had been drinking but was not intoxicated. She had a very serious rupture of a recent date and also some bruises on her head. The right ear was torn and bleeding. She told witnesses at 1.30 that morning she was going by Whitechapel Church when she saw some men coming and she crossed the road to get out of their way, but they followed her. They assaulted her, robbed her of all the money she had and then commenced to outrage her. She could not say if they used a knife. She could not describe them except that one looked about 19. After her admission, she slowly sank and died at nine o'clock on Wednesday morning. The house surgeon continued that he had made a post-mortem examination and found that the injuries had been caused by some blunt instrument which had been used with great force. The coroner said that from the medical evidence it was clear that the woman had been barbarously murdered. Such a dastardly assault he had never heard of, and it was impossible to imagine a more brutal case. The jury returned a verdict of willful murder against some persons unknown. From the Globe, 7th of August, 1888. The mysterious tragedy in Whitechapel supposed murder of a woman. About ten minutes to five o'clock in the morning, John Reeve, who lives at 37 George Yard Buildings, Whitechapel, was coming downstairs to go to work when he discovered the body of a woman lying in a pool of blood on the first floor landing. Reeves at once called in Constable 26 H. Barrett who was on beat in the vicinity of George Yard, and Dr Keeling of Brick Lane was communicated with and promptly arrived. He immediately made an examination of the, of the woman and pronounced life extinct, and gave it as his opinion that she had been brutally murdered, there being knife wounds on her breast and abdomen. The body, which was that of a woman apparently between 35 and 40 years of age, about 5 foot 3 in height, dark complexion and hair dark, wore a dark green skirt and brown petticoat, a long black jacket and a black bonnet. The woman is unknown to any of the occupants of the tenements on the landing on which the deceased was found, and no disturbance of any kind was heard during the night. The circumstances of the tragedy are, therefore, mysterious, and the body, which up to the time of writing has not been identified, has been removed to Whitechapel Mortuary. Inspector Ellison of the Commercial Street Police Station has placed the case in the hands of Inspector Reed of the Criminal Investigation Department, and that officer is now instituting inquiries. Up to this afternoon, 
no clues of any kind had come to the knowledge of the Commercial Street Police authorities. From the East London Observer, the 11th of August, 1888, a Whitechapel mystery, horrible outrage and a woman in George Yard found stabbed in 39 places. At about 10 minutes to 5 on Tuesday morning, a shocking discovery was made by John Reeves, a waterside labourer on his descending the stairs of 37 George Yard buildings, a block of model buildings inhabited by people of the poorest description and situated just off the Whitechapel Road. On reaching a landing on the stone stairs, he discovered the body of a woman lying in a pool of blood. Reeves at once called Constable T. Barrett, 26, H, who was on his beat in the vicinity of George Yard, and Dr. Keeling of Brick Lane, who was communicated with and promptly arrived. He made an examination of the woman and pronounced life extinct, giving it as his opinion that she had been brutally murdered, there being knife wounds on her breast, stomach and abdomen. The body was that of a woman apparently between 33 and 40 years of age. The deceased wore a dark green jacket and black bonnet. The woman was stated to be unknown to any of the occupants of the tenements on the landing on which the deceased was found, and no disturbance of any kind was heard during the night. The body was at once removed to the Whitechapel mortuary and Inspector Ellisdon of the Commercial Street Police Station placed the matter in the hands of Inspector Reed of the Criminal Investigation Department. The murder, for little doubt, could be entertained, but what the deceased had met her death by foul means had been the subject of considerable speculation on the part of the residents of Whitechapel, so unique and mysterious are the circumstances surrounding the case. The murderer, whoever he was, and there is every reason to suppose that it was a man, had evidently done his work well, for no vestige and no clue of any kind was given to the police to work on. The mystery was further enhanced by the fact that the woman was utterly unknown to any of the neighbours. The inquest took place on Thursday before Mr Collier, the deputy coroner of the South Eastern Middlesex Division, in the library of the Working Lads Institute at Whitechapel, and it was looked forward to with the keenest interest as being a probable means for eliciting the identity of the murdered woman. As a matter of fact, no less than three persons attended and swore to the identity of the woman in as many different names. The identification, however, of all three was more or less doubted, the greatest credence being attached to a woman who appeared early in the library with a baby in her arms. She wore a blue dress with a black hat and white checked blue handkerchief round her neck. She had been taken by Banks, the coroner's officer, to view the body at the mortuary and was positive in asserting that she recognised it as that of a woman of her acquaintance named Martha Turner, a married woman. But although the inquest was ostensibly carried out upon the body of Martha Turner, the proofs of identity were so vague that the deputy coroner, towards the end of the inquest, expressed the opinion that it was scarcely worthwhile calling the woman who professed to identify the deceased as a witness, at all events not until further proof had been forthcoming of the accuracy of the identification. The interest envisaged in the case was proved by the unprecedentedly large number of summoned jurymen who put in an appearance, 20 of them in all who appointed a Mr. Geary as their foreman. They sat to the left of the coroner, who had on his right Dr. Keeling and Inspector Reed, a smart-looking man dressed in blue serge, who, 
without taking as much as a note seemed to be absorbing all the material points. Before the coroner sat, the woman who had identified the deceased as Martha Turner with her baby in her arms and accompanied by another woman, evidently her mother, dressed in an old brown figured pompadour. Above the coroner hung a magnificent portrait by Herr Louis Fleischmann of the Princess of Wales, while other portraits of the royal family and landscape pictures were in profusion around the walls of the room. It was in this library, so well and prettily furnished, that the details of the Whitechapel mystery was unravelled. The first witness called was a Mrs Elizabeth Mahoney, a young woman of some 25 to 26 years age, plainly clad in a rusty black dress with a black woollen shawl pinned round her shoulders. Her evidence was neither very much to the point or distinctly uttered indeed. So low was her voice as to elicit a complaint from the jurymen which was remedied by the witness being made to stand immediately next to the jury. Mrs. Elizabeth Mahoney disposed thus. I live at 37 George Yard Buildings, a block of model dwellings, and am a married woman, my husband Joseph being a carman, while I work at a match factory at Stratford, where I work from nine in the morning, usually till about seven o'clock at night. So far as I can remember, I have occupied rooms in the present house for about eight months. Monday was bank holiday, and my husband and I were out all day and did not return until twenty minutes to two on Tuesday morning. We went straight up to our room, and after taking off my hat and my cloak, I went down again and went to a chandler's shop in Thrall Street to buy some provisions for supper. I came back, having been gone about five minutes, and having supper we went to bed. On no occasion, either in coming or going, down the stairs did I see the body of a woman lying there. It's quite possible that a body might have been there, and that I did not notice it, because the stairs are very wide, and they were completely dark. All the lights having, as usual, been turned out at eleven o'clock. I did not get up till half past eight in the morning, and during the night my attention was not attracted by a noise or disturbance of any kind. I did not know of the body of the deceased having been found on the stairs till about ten o'clock on Tuesday morning. Questioned at the instigation of Inspector Reed, she reiterated that at the place where the body was subsequently found, it was quite possible, so wide was the staircase, for her to have passed it without noticing it. Alfred George Crow was the next witness. In appearance, he was a young man of about 23 or 4, with closely cropped hair and beardless but intelligent face and he wore a shabby green overcoat. Said Alfred George Crow, I live at 37 George Yard Buildings and am a cab driver, my number being 6609. I came home at half past three on Tuesday morning, which is about my usual time. Although I am on day duty, I went straight up to my lodgings. I had no light with me, and I went to the same staircase as the last witness. On my way up, I noticed there was somebody lying on the first landing. My eyesight is very good, and I noticed a body lying there just as I turned the landing. I am accustomed, however, to find people lying sleeping there, and took no notice at the time, not even to ascertain whether the body was that of a male or female. I don't know, therefore, whether the deceased was alive or dead at the time I saw her. I went off to bed and did not come out again before half past nine, and up to that time I heard no noise at all of any kind. 
When I went down the stairs, then the body was gone, and I did not know what had been done with it. When I first saw the body, I took so little notice that I am not prepared to say whether or not it was the body of this female at all. George Saunders Reeves, a very short man, with a slight dark beard and moustache, a pale and contracted face, dressed in corduroy trousers and black overcoat, and wearing earrings, was next called. He was, he said, a waterside labourer, living at George Yard Buildings. In the course of his work he had to get out very early in the morning, and on Tuesday morning he proceeded to go out to work at a quarter to five in the morning. On reaching the first floor landing, he proceeded, I found a female there lying on her back in a pool of blood. I didn't stop to examine her further, but gave information to a police constable who I met in the street. I went up to my room on Monday night at six o'clock and remained there all night till I went down at quarter to five, and during that time I, I heard no unusual noises. I made no examination whatever of the body when I first saw it, but I did notice that all the clothes were disarranged, being open in front. I did not notice any footmarks on the staircase, nor did I find a knife or any other instrument lying there. The hands of the deceased were clenched, but contained no hair or anything else, nor was there any blood coming from the mouth. Police Constable T. Barrett, 226H, a young constable who gave his evidence very intelligently, said, On Tuesday morning I was on duty at about quarter to five when my attention was called to George Yard Buildings by Reeves, the last witness. I followed him up the stairs and found the deceased lying on her back. She was dead, but I at once sent for a doctor. The body was not moved by by me or Reeves before the doctor came. I noticed that the hands were clenched, but there was nothing in them. The clothes were turned up as far as the centre of the body, leaving the lower part of the body exposed. The legs were open, and altogether her position as such as to at once suggest in my mind that recent intimacy had taken place. The deceased was not known on the streets. Dr. T. R. Keeling gave his evidence as follows. I'm a fully qualified doctor practicing in Brick Lane and was called to the deceased on the morning of the 7th of August at about half past five. I found her dead. On examining the body externally, I found no less than 39 puncture wounds. From my examination of the body, it seemed to be that of a woman of about 36 years of age and was well nourished. I have since made a post-mortem examination of the body. The brain was healthy, the left lung was penetrated in five places, and the right lung in two places, but the lungs were otherwise perfectly healthy. The heart was rather fatty and was perforated in one place, but there was otherwise nothing in the heart to cause death, although there was some blood in the pericardium. The liver was healthy, but was penetrated in five places. The spleen was perfectly healthy and was also penetrated in two places. Both the kidneys were perfectly healthy. The stomach was also perfectly healthy, but was penetrated in six places. The intestines were healthy, and so were all the other organs. The lower portion of the body was penetrated in one place, the wound being about three inches in length and one in depth. From appearances, there was no reason to suppose that recent intimacy had taken place. I don't think that all the wounds were inflicted with the same instrument, because there was one wound on the breastbone which did not correspond were the other wounds on the body. The instrument with which the wounds were inflicted would most probably be an ordinary knife, but a knife could not 
cause such a, a wound as that to the breastbone. That wound, I think, should have been inflicted with some form of dagger. I am of opinion that the wounds were inflicted during life, and from the direction in which they took, it is my opinion that although some of them could have been self-inflicted, yet there were others which could not have been so inflicted. The wounds generally would have been inflicted by a right-handed person. There was no sign whatever of any struggle having taken place, and there was a deal of blood between the legs which were separated. Death was due to hemorrhage and loss of blood, Mr. Collier, having called the attention of the jury to the fact that no perfectly satisfactory identification had yet been made, suggested the advisability of adjourning the inquest till that day fortnight. In the meantime, Inspector Reed, who had the case in hand, would do all he could to ascertain the assailant of the woman. It is one of the most terrible cases, concluded Mr. Collier, with unusual animation, that anyone can possibly imagine. The man must have been a perfect savage to have attacked the woman in that way. This concludes this episode of Whitechapel Wednesdays. We hope you really enjoyed the show. The next set of relevant chronological news reports will be uploaded next Wednesday. If you enjoyed the show, please subscribe and tell your friends. Subscribing really helps us. We're aiming for 1,000 subscribers. There's no cost to you and it really helps us. Just tap on the subscribe button that pops up if you haven't already subscribed. We have listened to our listeners' feedback and are working on increasing our longer episodes to four times a week. They will be uploaded Tuesdays, Wednesdays for our Whitechapel Wednesday, Thursdays and our new Serial Killer Saturdays. With shorter but we believe still interesting stories uploaded the other days of the week. For our podcast listeners, you can see this podcast with the associated pictures on our YouTube channel at News of the Times. You can find the link in the show notes. Thank you again for listening. This has been News of the Times, and I am Robin Coles.